Improving Rider Experiences on MBTA Buses. This presentation offers a data analytics-based understanding of the problem of current bus scheduling and offers a solution that could be implemented as a smartphone app. In this presentation, I will present the concept of bus bunching. Using the T's own data that I collected into a data warehouse, I will show how buses operate so far from schedule that timeliness cannot reasonably be assessed. Again, using the T-Zone data, I will show measurements of bus availability, in other words, time between buses, and the influence that bus bunching has, very short waits and very long waits. I'll show that when you break the day down, the very long waits occur largely in rush hour periods when reliability is needed most. Next, I'll set the stage for a simulation by explaining how bus bunching grows from small imbalances in the system. Then I demonstrate it in the simulator. I offer alternatives, then focus on the one with the highest ROI or return on investment, namely changing the bus governance policy to maintain equal distances between the buses. I demonstrate this new policy in the simulator, then compare the results which are a significant improvement over the current bus governance policy. I also offer an implementation loosely called Uberfication, which would consist of a smartphone or similar device on the bus driver's dashboard, telling him when to hold at a stop based on updates from a continuously monitoring service server. Yes, I've built systems like this before. No, not for transportation. Let's begin. Waiting for the bus is never fun. It seems the bus is either really early or really late. And in fact, there's some truth to this. A phenomenon known as bus bunching is responsible for creating these extremes. The problem these extremes create for riders is uncertainty and unpredictability. How am I going to explain my lateness again today? This is the third time this week. My app says the bus should have been here 10 minutes ago. Have you ever seen this? This is one bus directly after another. An example of bus bunching. Every time you see this, you know something's wrong because it's inefficient. The lead bus is packed and the trailing bus is almost empty. Furthermore, the very short wait between these two buses is offset by a very long wait somewhere else. The Wikipedia entry for bus bunching discusses this phenomenon and points out that the results can be unreliable service and longer effective wait times for some passengers. However, this entry doesn't offer any solutions. Bus bunching is not a very technical term, but it seems to be a well-known problem. In this presentation, I will explain bus bunching, how it occurs, and how to prevent it. By preventing it, we can eliminate excessively long wait times and dampen overcrowding of buses. We'll start by taking a look at the data. So how late is the bus? Using the real-time API, from the MBTA's developer portal. I collected bus locations every 60 seconds. Using a little math, I was able to compute the actual times when buses arrived at the stops. I compared this with the scheduled times when the buses should have arrived in order to compute the difference, the whether the bus was early or later or on time. Row level information is useful. For example, in this row, we see that the bus was 131 seconds late. In the next example, 132 seconds late. But it's difficult to get an understanding of overall performance by looking at row level data. To get a big picture, what we'll do is we'll condense row level information into a frequency distribution table. If we agree that on time means plus or minus two minutes or plus or minus 120 seconds, then we have 
699 entries of row level information where the bus fell within those brackets. Similarly, we have 1202 cases or rows where the bus was two to five minutes early, and on the other side, 617 cases where it was two to five minutes late. The frequency distribution table is useful, but it's not giving us that big picture we might be looking for. To get the bigger picture, let's graph it. We'll rotate it and present it as a table of columns or a chart of columns. You can see this is the identical information. Let's start with plus or minus two minutes, which is a little over uh, almost 700 times. And yes, we confirm 699 times we deem the bus to be on time plus or minus two minutes. In the two to five minute early case, we've got uh, 1202 entries. And in the two to five minute late case, we've got a little over 600, uh, 617 to be specific. We don't need to pull out our slide rules to see that this is a lot of variation. And in fact, we find if we go back to the data, that the bus was on time less than 20% of the time. This creates tremendous rider uncertainty. But maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. With a bus that's supposed to come every 10 minutes or so, maybe we shouldn't be looking at the schedule. Let's throw it out and let's throw out the concepts of early and late, and instead, let's look at how often the bus comes. In other words, from bus to bus, if I stood at a stop with a stopwatch, how often is the bus arriving? We're going back to very much the same data, but we don't care about the scheduled time stop anymore. We're simply looking at row over row, over row or time over time data and computing the wait time there. Sure, it's not exactly the wait time. It's the time between buses, but if somebody comes along just missing a bus, they're going to have to wait this amount of time for the next bus to come along. So we see in the top example, the time between the first bus and the second bus was 20 minutes and 31 seconds. The second and the third, 27 minutes and 55 seconds, and so on. As was the case in the prior analysis, row level data really doesn't give us the big picture. To get the big picture, we'll condense this down into a frequency distribution table. The difference with this frequency distribution table is that the concept of early and late are now gone, and we're simply looking at the time that it took between buses. Our short times, expected times, and long wait times represented in the frequency distribution table. As was the case with the prior analysis, let's rotate this and present it visually for a better understanding of the distribution. We have our short waits, expected, and long waits. And what jumps out pretty quickly is the long tail here of waits of 25, 30, 35 minutes, sometimes uh, as much as an hour. If you've ever waited more than 30 minutes for a bus, particularly in the cold, you'll appreciate the pain of these excessively long wait times. According to the data collected in October, 29% of the wait periods were more than 15 minutes, more than the expected wait time based on the schedule. This creates rider uncertainty. When we segment the day into periods, morning rush hour, evening rush hour, the times between, before, and at the end of the day, the data tells a story that's even worse. Rush hour is when one some of the worst wait periods occur and it's the time when riders need consistency and reliability most. So what's going on? Let's take a closer look. Here's a simplified version of a bus route. It's a 40-minute loop, and there are four buses on it. 
Spaced evenly, the buses are 10 minutes apart. Ignoring traffic, stop times, and other delays, a waiting rider can expect a wait time of no more than 10 minutes. Let's put some riders into the route, into the route waiting at stops between the buses. The numbers of riders at each stop will vary based on the length of time since the last bus was there. In the first case, a few riders have accumulated because the bus was just at the stop. In the second case, more riders have accumulated because it's been longer since the bus was at the stop. However, in this scenario, the buses are evenly spaced and the weight is predictable. This system of buses is in equilibrium. Let's disrupt our system of buses, for example, with a construction stop, which holds one of the buses for a period. While the bus indicated in red is stopped, the bus ahead of it continues. Distances between the buses have increased and additional waiting riders have accumulated. When the red bus begins to move again, it'll do so slowly because the increased number of waiting riders will take longer to load and unload. The bus behind it will be the opposite. It will speed up because it has fewer riders to load and unload. This is an exaggerated situation with a significant impact. However, bus bunching can start with a tiny delay. Tiny delays snowball into significant delays for the reasons mentioned. Once the bus is delayed, however, however little, it slows down more and more with accumulating waiting riders. The trailing bus accelerates with fewer and fewer waiting riders. Tiny delays happen to buses all the time. An extra rider, a slower traffic light, a pedestrian crossing the road. All it takes is a minor delay to knock the buses out of equilibrium and the problem escalates and it does not take long before they're one bus directly after the other. Let's break away from PowerPoint to see this happen in a simulation. I've created the simulation in AnyLogic. AnyLogic is available for download at the uh, anylogic.com and my model is available for download at a link provided at the uh, at the end of this presentation. In fact, both both links are at the end of the presentation. So you can run this simulation yourself. I've modeled the route on a map, bus stops, the bus and its behavior and the parameters for its operation, riders and their behavior and parameters as well and trips, which are basically objects. So let's go ahead and fire it up and see it running. These up here are my controls for operating the system. I can create riders uh, and the number of riders per minute that are created. Here's the rider load time, rider unload time, uh, policy, which I'll explain later, and uh, bus speed, maximum bus speed. We see the first bus, bus zero, leaving the depot in Cambridge, going through Harvard Square, and it will run out to Watertown. Let's speed it up a little bit. Uh, let's not speed the bus up, but speed the simulation up. And you can see this bus doing some gyrations. I wanted to point that out early. It's a distortion that uh, is because the bus, uh, the GIS software does not know about an underground tunnel. So it's routing the bus around crazy back streets in order to satisfy the route. It is a distortion, but it's not a biasing distortion that will influence our results. Uh, bus number zero with zero passengers on it. The purple is the bus number and the, and the black number is the number of passengers. Over here at the depot, you'll see a green flash. That green flash is, uh, represents a trip. And when it occurs, the first bus in line will satisfy that trip, uh, clear it, and, and begin moving on the trip. I uh, did not see the flash occur that time. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye open for, for it on the next one. I'll speed it up a little. 
there's our green flash, and bus number three is jumping onto the route. Let's begin creating riders. Riders are represented by little stick figures at the various bus stops, and you'll see that when the bus stops to pick them up, the number of passengers on the bus increases. And we can see that represented in a couple of places. First, we can see down here, riders, number of riders on the bus. And over here, uh, this is across the network of four buses. We can see first, the dark blue is the number of riders waiting at stops. Let's speed this up a bit more. In light blue are the number of riders on the bus. And gold is the number of riders who have arrived at their destination. Let's allow the system to stabilize. And when it does, uh, these won't continue to grow anymore. There we go. We're fa fairly stabilized now. We continue to see the buses stopping at the depot, waiting for the next trip to in initiate uh, with the green light, and off they go. With only two riders per minute, we see the number of riders on the bus. Uh, the buses is, is rather conservative, and we see that uh, the, the, the time between buses is fairly uh, nominal and a narrow band, uh, generally uh, plus or minus 10 minutes. The distribution is, is, is again quite narrow. Well, let's see what happens to this when we start increasing the number of riders. Let's bump it right up to four riders per minute. We'll begin to see an impact here uh, with the number of riders waiting uh, the number of riders on the bus and the number of riders arriving at their destination. We're also going to see the number of riders on the bus impacted here. And let's take a look at the buses on the route. We're seeing that but the, 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 the signal indicating the start of a new trip is occurring before a bus even arrives back at the depot. So the bus the buses are falling behind schedule even before they've arrived. And as a consequence, as soon as they load up, they get back into the route. And already, we're seeing buses one and two beginning to come together in bus bunching. There they are together. We'll see three and zero eventually catch up with one convoy or another. One and two continue to be close together. Three may be catching up with one and two, or one and two are catching up to zero. Not sure which is happening. We can speed time up a little bit more, because I can't wait. Now let's speed it back, slow it down again. Here we see, okay, so we've got zero, one, and two together, and we've got three as, a, as an outlier um, um, on its own path. So we've got bus bunching occurring with not just two, but three buses now. And the results of it, we're going to start seeing down here in our time between buses. We'll also see it to some degree in the number of riders on the bus. Let's go ahead and speed this simulation up again. Here we go. We're seeing a 30 minute wait. Oh, we've got close to maybe a 35 minute wait here. And we're starting to see some buses approach uh, full. We're also seeing some uh, almost empty buses. I'm going to reset these statistics so that they're not diluted by uh, when we were running at uh, uh, two riders per minute. Let's see what's going on in real time now. We're seeing short waits. And when the results come in, we start to see longer waits. So we've got a bit of a barbell here. All right, 
we'll go ahead and pause. We've got some full buses, we've got some nearly empty buses, we've got some short weights, and we've got long weights. So uncontrolled, the buses fell behind schedule. When they arrived at the depot, they picked their passengers up, dropped their passengers off, and uh, continued on. Any distances that had begun to close continued to close because the trailing bus would always accelerate over the leading bus, the leading bus picking up and dropping off more passengers than the trailing bus. So we saw that snowballing effect take, take place, not just with two buses, but with three. And the results are clear. Returning now to PowerPoint, let's ask ourselves, what can be done about this bus bunching problem? Well, the first thing we could do is add more buses, but that comes at a pretty significant cost. The next thing we could do is we could spread out the buses we have so that they never fall behind and that they continue to be deployed on a uniform basis. That would, uh, that would make it uh, predictable for riders, but the time between buses would go up uh, predictably <laughs> and, um, and, and waiting riders would, would have to wait longer. So I'm not sure they'd be willing to make that trade. The last thing that we could do is we could try to maintain equilibrium to fize away to keep the distances between the buses somewhat uniform. That's what I've done, and so we'll return to any logic to see how that operates. Here we are back in the simulator. Let's go ahead and fire it up. And we're going to change the policy to equilibrium. So the bus won't be following the trips any longer. The buses will be deployed and, main, and the distances maintained based on an algorithm, which I'll explain later. So play, and let's uh, speed it up again. We see the first bus coming out, and when it's effectively 25% into the route, the next one comes out. And the next. And the next. When you see the bus flash red in the route, it's making an, an adjustment. We shouldn't see it happen many times without riders in, in the route because uh, all things are, are, are pretty much equal. But as soon as we start adding riders, we expect to see that happening, and it's breaking. It's 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 trying to balance for uh, falling out of equilibrium. We can't speed up because of traffic conditions and people and such, but we can slow down. So that's how we do it. I'll slow it down a little bit here, and let's start adding riders. So we're starting at the same level that we did with the last simulation, which is uh, two riders per minute, and. We can see buses periodically stopping for uh, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. In addition to the load unload, they're holding at the stop until sufficient space in front of them is available. Think of it like an, an electronic bumper. And that electronic bumper extends out past from a bus to the bus in front of it, not quite a quarter of the distance. A little bit less. If it were a full quarter, then we'd have gridlock and all the buses would lock up. That that buffering or that elasticity would be something that uh, uh, to perfect the system, uh, uh, data analysts would uh, would want to focus on. All right, let's speed it back up again until it stabilizes. All right. We're fairly stable now. We see that the, the, the number of riders on the bus is, is comparable to what we saw in the scheduled uh, policy. And we also see that the time between buses is approximately the same as, as we had in the scheduled. It's actually a little bit better than what we had in the uh, scheduled policy because the, the, we're not losing um, an arbitrary amount of time up at the depot. 
we're losing only little bits of time that we need in order to keep the, the buses equally separated. So um, at, at, a, um, um, at a lower operating level with only two passengers per minute, uh, we're performing better. Now, let's slow it down and let's increase the number of riders per minute to four, which is what we had before in the other scenario. What we should see is a pickup here in the number of waiting passengers as well as the number of riding passengers, followed by the number of arrived passengers. We're also seeing an increase in the number of waits where the buses are sitting and waiting for sufficient space uh, to open up in front of them. And we'll speed this up again. Uh, speed it up a bit more because we're interested in the metrics. So what we're seeing here is an increase in utilization of the buses. In other words, more people on the bus. Uh, we're not seeing any full buses yet, but that could change. And what we're seeing over here is an increase in uh, wait times, but we're not seeing the very long waits. Let's go ahead and reset the metrics so that we're looking at them uh, more currently and that they're not diluted by the, uh, uh, the, the prior instance of uh, two passengers per minute. Let's speed this back up again. So the riders on the bus is more uniform than we saw with the scheduled policy. And the time between buses is more uniform. It's a, it's a more predictable distribution. We're not seeing the excessively long wait times. Yes. The average time, or I should say the mean time between buses has gone up. It's almost 20 minutes, it's called 18 minutes uh, between buses on average. Uh, but, uh, but the distribution, we don't see these excessively long wait times. So the thesis was by maintaining equilibrium, we would eliminate excessively long wait times and we would eliminate the or, or dampen the overcrowding of buses. And I think this simulation shows that. Let's return to PowerPoint. Returning back to PowerPoint, let's look at the benefits of the equilibrium policy. Here are the results of uh, two prior runs, a scheduled policy run and an equilibrium policy run. And the first thing that we notice is that the equilibrium policy balances loads across buses. So we have fewer full buses leaving riders waiting for the next bus. And the riders on the bus um, are in less crowded buses. So they have a, a less crowded experience. But more importantly, we've eliminated the extremely long wait times with only a marginal increase in the mean wait time. Together, these things reduce rider uncertainty and, and dare I say, rider anxiety. How would this be implemented? Implementation of the equilibrium policy could be described as the uberfication of buses. An uber-like display sits on the driver's dashboard. The display is controlled by a network server that is continuously monitoring distances between buses. When a bus gets too close to the one in front, the display signals the driver to wait at the next stop. Once balance is restored to the network, the display signals the driver to resume. Wait times are not long because they're not correcting for bus bunching. They're short because they're correcting for minor delays throughout the system long before bus bunching has been allowed to snowball. Implementation of an equilibrium policy would require attention to several details that I did not model in the simulation. First, accommodations for disabled vehicles on the route. Second, adding and subtracting buses from a route. You want 
to add buses uh, for rush hour periods and you, and you want to take them out during the lull periods. And in doing so, they've got to find room. And so those buffers between buses need to be adjusted. And the last point is perfecting the parameters for the time between buses. Um, that the elasticity in that equation should accommodate parts of the route that might be inherently uh, prone to delays. Um, you, you might want to increase the elasticity. Uh, you might want to decrease it if, if buses are known to get on highways uh, where uh, ride time is uh, relatively constant. In summary, schedules have served transit systems for hundreds of years and remain valuable to modes with predictable operations such as planes, trains, and boats, but schedules are failing to deliver reliable service to public transportation buses with unpredictable operations, variable traffic and road conditions, and variable passenger loads. The current scheduling system is not working. The results are unpredictable and excessively long waits that impact riders every day. Modern technologies, such as the one presented, can fix the problem and significantly improve service for riders. I'm Dave Sproges. I built the software to collect and analyze MBTA data for professional development reasons. I did not expect to discover actionable insights, but when I did, felt compelled to solve them. Simulation was the best way to prove the solution. Creating this presentation was the best way to share it. That's it for the presentation, but I've got a couple of notes to share as well. The first are the modeling notes. The way that the riders were generated assumes that at the end, at each end of the route, that there's a hub. So for example, with the 71 route, there's a, a hub that's Harvard Square, and there's another hub, which is Watertown Square, where riders can transfer to uh, other transportation modes. So one would expect that the number of riders heading to one hub would grow and then coming away from that hub, a, a, a number of riders would be picked up and then distributed across the route. And of course, the, the opposite would be true as well for the other end of the route, and they would overlap. And then one would expect a number of riders to just simply be random riders going from point A to point B. Uh, this modeling is uh, uh, can certainly be inspected if you download the model and, and take a look at it. The other thing that might be interesting to you is the, the buses um, and how they're scheduled. Uh, trips are deployed every 10 minutes. Of course, this is somewhat arbitrary because um, you can approximate a, a, a route, but you can't actually model it uh, 100%. So I was using uh, 10 minutes. The code base, uh, the Charlie Scorecard is the name that I gave to the software as a service application I created to collect and analyze MBTA data. Now you can download that from GitHub at the link provided there. And then the simulation, you'll have to download two parts. First, the simulation software from AnyLogic. And uh, second, uh, you'll have to download the model that I created uh, from the GitHub link that I provide here. And that is the end. Thank you for your time and interest.